focus on the breath. Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths first. to highlight your sense of the body as you feel it from within. And if long breathing feels good, keep it up. If it doesn't, you're free to change. Try shorter breathing, in, short, out, long, in, long, out, short, fast, slow, heavy, light, deep, shallow. Try to get sensitive to what the body really needs right now. In this way, you're showing goodwill for yourself. And of course, it spreads out to others. If you can create a sense of well-being, a sense of being centered inside, people will find you a lot better person to be around. So as we work on showing goodwill to ourselves in this way, we're learning some important lessons about goodwill. In fact, all of the Brahma Viharas. One of the first lessons is that happiness doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. There's so many areas out in the world where it's just that. One person gains, another person has to lose. But here it's gaining all around. You're more centered inside. Other people are less subject to your greed, aversion, and delusion. You're more solid inside. People can rely on you more. And at the same time, you begin to realize there are opportunities for well-being that you may not have thought of before. I know for me, learning a John Lee's method of breath meditation was very different from the other method, breath meditation methods I'd learned before. <clears throat> the other ones, one, you weren't supposed to play with the breath. It was just nice to stick with whatever the breath was doing on its own, as if the breath was acting on its own. And nothing about breath energies in the body. And both of those points opened up lots of worlds of possibilities. And changed my mind about what well-being could be. And so as you find, as you begin to explore potentials for well-being inside, it teaches you a lesson. Look for them outside as well. There are lots of areas where there are possibilities for well-being in your life, both for yourself and for others. And the problem is you simply overlook them. There are opportunities for generosity, there are opportunities for being careful, sensitive. To the needs and well-being of other people. If you simply look for them, it's good to have some guidance. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha said the whole of the holy life is having admirable friends, people who can point these things out to you. But once you get their attitude, which is look in areas where you might not have thought of things before, you begin to see that you can explore on your own. Now, as you're working with the breath, you find that there are parts of the body that are uncomfortable. Well, you learn how to work with them. You don't simply accept them as a given. There's got to be a pain there. Maybe the pain is being caused by something you're doing. Maybe it's being caused by the way you perceive the body or relationship to the body or you hold the energy in the body. Some malfunctions of the organs can be that way, too. The circulation gets cut off to a particular organ because the breath energy has been cut off there, and it's going to suffer. So this is a lesson in compassion. Just because someone is suffering doesn't mean they have to keep on suffering. That applies to you and applies to other people, too. The teaching on karma doesn't say, well, somebody's suffering, they must deserve it because of something they did in the past. When you see somebody's 
present situation, you're not seeing the sum total of their past actions. There may be potentials there for something good. So when you see that there's a pain or there's suffering, there's something you can do about it, try your best to see if you can think out a way of helping. And once there is a sense of well-being, try to maintain it. Try not to get bored. Just by being still, just by having a sense of well-being. This is a skill you're working on, because you're trying to create a good foundation in the mind. You're trying to create a new sense of what is normal for you. Psychologists have studied that there are a lot of people who have a kind of a happiness quotient, where the events of life may raise their level of happiness or lower their level of happiness for a little while, but then they tend to get back to their default mode. And nothing much can budge them out of that default mode. Well, meditation is one of the things that can budge you. It takes a while. Sometimes there's a sense of well-being in, in the breath, and it feels not quite right to have so much well-being. Some people are afraid of well-being, afraid that if they enjoy the well-being, that they're going to be setting themselves up for a fall. And those are attitudes you've got to erase. Well-being is something that can be maintained, and it's a good thing. And it's not a question of whether you deserve it or not. The word deserve never appears in the Buddhist teaching, except for one thing. Our hands deserve our respect. But there's nothing about people deserving to suffer. After all, when the Buddha taught how to put an end to suffering, he didn't ask people, what karma did you do in the past that's making you suffer right now? I'll teach you only if you don't have any bad karma. He wouldn't have anybody to teach. He taught an end to suffering for all cases of suffering, whether it was quote-unquote deserved or not. So learn how to maintain a sense of well-being. And as I said, don't get bored with it. All too many, all too many times this is what happens in the world. People get a sense of well-being, and they get bored, and then they start looking for trouble. rather than continuing to build on top of that, which is what we're trying to do. We get a sense of well-being in the body, a sense of well-being in the mind. Then we ask ourselves, what more can be done to raise the level of well-being? But first you've got to get your foundation solid. And as it turns out, by solidifying the sound foundation, the next step will appear. So don't keep casting your eyes down the path, say, well, when, when is insight going to come, and when's the next step going to come? Keep your eyes focused on what you're doing right here, right now. And whatever ways the mind is going to develop, it will come from focusing right here, right now. There's no such thing as right anticipation as a factor of the path. These lessons in well-being around the breath transfer into lessons around well-being outside. You have empathetic joy for yourself. There's a sense of well-being here. Learn how to maintain it, protect it. It means you learn how not to be jealous of other people's well-being. You want to encourage them in learning how to be skillful and how to maintain it. Because as we see all around us, there are people who have status, they have wealth, they have power. And they seem to be doing their best to abuse it, which means they're destroying the foundation for their well-being. They don't even know it. So instead of thinking, well, it does, serves them right, you think, what can be done to help them see the error of their way so they can get back to having a sense of well-being? The Buddha was able to teach people of all kinds, from the bottom levels of society all the way up to the top. He wasn't jealous of the people at the top. He didn't look down at the people at the bottom. He considered everybody equal in the sense of wanting to find your happiness. Some of the people are really, really deluded about how they go about it.
So his job was to help explain things so that people, if they were interested, could get past their suffering, maintain their well-being. But there was that big if, if they were interested. Someone once asked the Buddha, now that he'd established, opened up the way to awakening, was the whole world going to go there, or half the world, or a third of the world? The Buddha didn't answer. Ananda was afraid that the questioner would get upset because the Buddha didn't answer, so he pulled him aside. And he gave an analogy. He said, it's like a front frontier fortress. And there's one gate, and there's a wise, experienced gatekeeper, and he walks around the fortress. And aside from the gate, he doesn't see any holes in the wall big enough for even a cat to slip through. And so because he's wise, he doesn't come to the conclusion of, how many people are going to come into the fortress, but he does know whoever's going to come into the fortress, any sizable animal coming into the fortress, has to go through the gate. In the same way, the Buddha established his teaching, pointed out the way, said, if you're going to gain awakening, this is how it's done. But it wasn't his job to decide how many people were going to go out, follow his path. He couldn't make people follow the path. After all, we do have freedom of choice. It's because of this freedom of choice that we have to have equanimity. Now, you learn equanimity as you're working with the breath. You realize there's some parts of the body that you can't change, no matter how well you breathe, no matter where you focus, no matter how strong your concentration. But you can work around those. You don't have to let them be obstacles. And you just do your best. Same way this is how you deal with people outside. There are obstacles out there. There are people who will not budge, will not change their ways. We learn how to work around them. You're doing your best as to how the chips will fall in the end. Some of those things are under your control. A lot of those things are not. This is where equanimity comes in. But also the realization, if you're going to make your well-being depend on succeeding and changing the world outside, Remember that chant we had just now, the world is swept away. It's a given. It does not endure. Offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. It has nothing of its own. The thing is, what do you have that is of your own? And that's the perfections you build in the mind, the noble treasures you build in the mind. That's an area where you can exert some control, where you can make a change. And so you do your best to develop your perfections, generosity, virtue, renunciation, discernment, persistence, endurance, truth, determination, goodwill, and equanimity. You work on these, and you hope that their influence will spread out into the world, but you can't determine how many people will benefit from it, just as the Buddha himself couldn't determine how many people were going to take his way to awakening. Your duty is to work on your perfections, confident that there will be a good influence, but how far that influence will go, that's something over which you have no control. But you do know what you're doing is good. As long as the cause is good, there is results However that far they go, will have to be good results. So as we work with the breath, dealing with the problems of getting the breath to create a sense of well-being in the body, we're learning a lot of lessons about all the Brahma-viharas, how they apply to us right now and how they apply to life in general, our engagement with the world. So that that wish that begins the realm of ours, may I be happy, may all beings be happy, will not be empty wishes. You may not be able to make all beings happy, but you want to make sure that from your quarter there's nothing that's going to interfere with their genuine happiness. And as for your own genuine happiness, you do everything you can to work on that, realizing that it's not a selfish pursuit.
the happiness that comes from within is a happiness that doesn't just stay within. It spreads its benefits all around. <laughs> 